Okay, let's make a start then. So, this is Fundamentals of Physics C. Um, it might be down, uh, but you're here for Fundamentals A. Um, that's just a, a change around, it doesn't matter for you guys. Um, so, uh, this first section we're going to be looking at is electricity. So, um, I'll go into more detail later on about all the different sections that are going to be in this course. Um, so we've got a nice cosy lecture theatre, so it's not really applied here, but in the bigger lecture theatres uh, people tend to spread out. So because of the way I organise this lecture it's better to be seated where you can talk relatively easily to your neighbour. Um, but before, before I uh, get into the actual content of the course, I think it'd be useful to give a bit of background um, about my, my research background, sort of topics I'm interested in, that'll help give you an idea of where I'm coming from, what my expertise are. So I'll just give you a brief rundown of my research. So I'll just group this into some various topics that I look at. Um, so one of the things I look at is laser written waveguides. So a waveguide is simply a structure that can guide light. So an optical fibre is a waveguide, it can carry light from one place to another so it stops it diverging. Um, they can also be in uh, bulk, so it can be in a, a solid lump or something where you can't bend it. And that is the sort of waveguide that I looked at. So I made waveguides in solid pieces of glass. It was a, it was a very special piece of glass. Um, known as a charcogenide. Um, you probably never heard of that before, but all it means is it's a glass based on sulphur or selenium or tellurium. And these have got very special properties. Um, so it's very interesting to try and make optical structures inside these glasses. Um, and the way I did it was to use a very special type of laser called a femtosecond laser. So a femtosecond laser gives incredibly short pulses of laser light. Um, so a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, so it's kind of difficult to get your head around how short that is. Uh, to put it one way, um, if one, one second compared to the age of the universe is is not as short as a femtosecond is compared to a second. Um, so a femtosecond laser produces the shortest anything produced by man. Um, so it's incredibly short pulses. Um, and the peak powers are very high. So the act, you could measure the, the peak power of the laser at that pulse. Um, it's probably a megawatt or something, which is incredibly powerful for a laser. Um, the average power isn't that high. You can put your hand in front of it, and it doesn't do anything to your hand. But it has some very interesting properties when you can focus it down inside a material. Because the peak powers are incredibly high, you get special effects called nonlinear effects. So that is where the optical properties of the material have a dependence on the power of the light that's going in. So refractive index and absorption has a dependence on the power of the light. Um, and so the way I made these was if I had my, my block of glass, the, the focus of the laser would be inside the glass and it wouldn't cause any effects um, on the surface, but where you reach the focus spot, focus point, somewhere inside the glass, 
it caused a change in the structure of the glass that increased its refractive index. And then I just translated the glass sample so that that, that spot that changed the structure of the glass moved through the glass and created a, a line of increased refractive index. So buried inside the glass was like if you imagine this little tube of increased refractive index and then that could guide light. Um, and that could be very useful for if you wanted to build some optical devices. So these glasses can potentially switch light very quickly. So if you wanted to build some kind of optical computer or optical switching device, um, it could be used for that. Um, I also made carbon nanotube devices. Uh, so this is in my uh, second post position in Japan. Um, so carbon nanotubes are one-dimensional conductors. And so they're, if you like, a perfect crystal of carbon. Uh, very, very thin. Um, so they can be less than a nanometer thick and they have what's called ballistic conduction so they're not superconductors but an electron can flow down them without bumping into the crystal lattice so if you can build a computer or, well, or a transistor out of these devices it can work much much faster than in silicon so in silicon the speed the electrons travel is limited by the fundamental properties of silicon. There's a lot less limitations in carbon nanotubes. And also, <coughs> the dimensions of these are incredibly small. So this is a device that I made, so it's <coughs> a transistor, so it's a switch, and it might be difficult to see, but going across here, there's a tiny line, and that is a single carbon nanotube that is bridging the gap between these two bits of metal. And that forms a field effect transistor. So I was able to make these field effect transistors um, and measure their optical properties so they can also sense and produce light. So these could be uh, like nanoscale optical sensors or um, light emitters um, and in the future if someone can figure out how to pattern carbon nanotubes so how to get them in the right structure um, then potentially we could build very very dense um, computer chips with many many devices per unit area using carbon nanotubes um, Another project I worked on with Cambridge was uh, modelling materials. So um, this is a type of first principles modelling where you take a cube of atoms of whatever material you want to investigate and you use something called ab initio modelling. So basically you program in the state of every electron of every atom inside that cube and then you can let it relax down to its lowest energy state and using that you can predict the material properties of the material you're investigating. Um, the main project I'm looking at is quantum technology so this is what's taking up most of my time now. Um, so quantum technologies are technologies which exploit quantum mechanical phenomena for some technological application. So there's two main applications for quantum technologies. Um, so these are quantum computation and quantum communication. So quantum computers are a really hot topic at the moment. And there's a lot of researchers <coughs> who are trying to find the right way of building quantum computer. So it's a lot of different material systems that are being investigated. Um, and no one's really quite sure what 
the best material system is. Um, but there's great promise for these. So, for example, there's certain problems, particularly in science, where you need to try every possible solution. So there's a lot of problems where there's an analytical solution, so you can just plug your numbers into an equation, it gives out the answer. And they're great for classical computers. They can just chug those answers out. But there's certain problems where there is no analytical solution. So there's no equation where you can just plug your inputs in and get the output. There's an equation, but you need to try every possible solution until you get the right answer. So examples of these problems are um, finding the shortest route through a network. So if you, um, it's also known as the traveling salesman problem. So if you imagine you've got a complicated network, um, you've got a lot of different points in a network. These have all got particular distance. So <coughs> Simplify those, and you need to find the shortest route from one point to another. Then there is no analytical solution to this. There's not an equation which will just chug out the answer. What you have to do is try every possible route. Obviously, it'd be quite simple with this, but if this is very big, then that problem can uh, increase in terms of computation time massively. Um, there's also searching an unsorted database. Uh, there's protein folding problems, which you get in biology. So for drug discovery um, and curing diseases, you need to work out how a particular protein is going to fold. And to solve that, you need to try every possible solution. And these are really um, intractable problems for classical computers. They just can't do it. Um, but what a quantum computer can do is it can take advantage of the quantum mechanical phenomena known as superposition. So superposition is the state where a quantum system can be in two states at once. So for example, an electron can have a property called spin. So it can spin clockwise or anti-clockwise, but it can also be in a state where it's spinning both clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time. So that's known as a superposition. So if, for example, we were to use the spin state of an electron as our bit, so the bit representing information in the computer, in the classical computer, we'd have spin up clockwise, spin down anti-clockwise would be the one or the zero. But if we got a superposition of states, then we can, our bit can represent a one and a zero at the same time. So if we were to scale this up into a computer, it's got lots and lots of these bits that can be a one and a zero at the same time then what we can do is program our, the interactions between these bits to represent the problem we want to solve. And then because those bits are a one and a zero at the same time, it can compute every possible solution to the problem in one go. So these problems that would take longer than the age of the universe for the most powerful classical computer can be <coughs> solved, in theory, in one go by a powerful enough quantum computer. So that is why people are very interested in this technology. Um, another really important um, application for quantum technologies is quantum communication. So uh, communication technology is relatively secure at the moment, so there's something called public key encryption that you use on the internet for your banking and it works on this um, problem we talked about so 
that the way it um, encrypts is that um, there's many you have to break that encryption you would have to try so many different possible solutions that it's just impractical for any classical computer to break that. If someone had a powerful enough classical computer or a quantum computer, then they could break that encryption. So if someone does make a scalable quantum computer, then that necessitates another type of encryption. And quantum encryption um, can do that. So Quantum encryption, again, uses these quantum states to encrypt a message. So if, for example, uh, Alice wants to send a message to Bob, and there's someone eavesdropping on the message that they're sending, what Alice can do is uh, send a key down a secure quantum channel. And if she, if she sends that key uh, in these quantum states that are in a superposition, so for example, if she sent single photons down um, an optical fiber, then if someone uh, intercepts these photons, reads them, and then tries to send them on again, due to the quantum nature of these particles, um, the receiver, Bob, would be able to statistically determine whether these, um, whether this key had been intercepted. <coughs> and the material that I'm looking at for this is erbium implanted silicon. So lots of other researchers are looking at different materials. I think erbium implanted silicon is the one to look at. So erbium would be the bit, so a single erbium atom. And erbium itself is really important, so erbium drives the internet. Um, so when you send a signal, so when you're on YouTube, on the internet, sending lots of data across the globe, that's only possible due to erbium. So almost all internet traffic goes through optical fibers that span the globe and unfortunately these light signals will decrease in intensity after about 100 kilometers or so after which time they need to be amplified and to do this amplification a short space of fiber has a little bit of erbium in and because of the energy levels in erbium uh, just by a stroke of luck the transition from the excited state of erbium down to its ground state exactly matches the wavelength of light that you want to send down an optical fiber. <coughs> so this means that you can amplify <coughs> these signals. I was talking for too long. So the reason I'm using erbium implanted silicon is that we've got this erbium which can work at communication wavelengths and we can also use silicon which is what's used to produce microchips. So if we're using silicon then we can pattern tiny tiny devices which is what we need to build these quantum devices. And um, as a first step to this, um, I've managed to measure a superposition of states of erbium when it's implanted into silicon. Um, and there's an experiment that we've got just a few doors down that I'm trying to set up 
that will measure how long the excited state of erbium stays in a superposition of states. Um, and it's a type of measurement that's really challenging and uh, no one's ever <coughs> done it before. And uh, it's been taking up a lot of my time to get it working. It's a really tricky measurement. Um, another line of research I'm looking at is um, semiconductor films. So again, I was looking at a material, this, these charcogenide materials, these special glasses that are made from sulfur. Um, and as well as being optical materials, they're also semiconductors. So they are naturally p-type semiconductors. So um, the, the conduction is with holes, so a, a missing electron in the electronic structure. Um, but unfortunately, because of the structure of, the, of these glasses, um, they naturally tend to stay p-type and no matter what you add to them you can't change them to n-type. Um, so to be useful electronic materials you need to be able to make p-type and n-type. So that allows you to build electronic devices like diodes and transistors um, but no one has been able to do it. Um, but what I found is that if you implant with bismuth you can change the carrier type from p-type to n-type and that allows you to make a p-n junction. Okay, so that's just a brief overview of my research. Um, I'll just talk briefly a bit about um, learning theory because um, a little bit of the understanding of learning theory went into the design of this lecture course. So. There are some traditional theories of learning um, where uh, the teacher is thought of as a transmitter of knowledge. So in traditional theories of learning, the instructor will um, transmit, usually in the form of a lecture, their knowledge to the students. Um, so in this case, the learners will listen and take no notes and uh, hopefully knowledge <coughs> is then transmitted from the teacher to the students. However, it's been known for quite a while that this isn't very effective. So if I were to just stand here for two hours and talk about physics, the amount of physics that would actually be transmitted from me to you if we were to test everybody after would be pretty low and it's not the fault of the students it's the method of teaching um, so more sophisticated theories of learning um, emerged in the 70s and 80s um, these are known as constructivism so here people thought a little bit more deeply about how students learn and they supposed that learners actively make sense of information when they're constructing their knowledge. So there's not just a transmission, knowledge coming from the teacher to the student. Each student is interpreting the information that's been given to them using their own knowledge that they already have and then use that previous knowledge and the information that's coming to them to construct their own version of this knowledge. So there's been a shift from knowledge acquisition to knowledge construction. So bearing this in mind, I've designed this lecture course to take this into account. So here the teacher will become a cognitive guide of the learner's learning and not just a transmitter of knowledge. So another teaching method um, that I used 
in this lecture course is known as peer instruction. Um, so in this method, the instructor poses a conceptual question. So this is something that you wouldn't usually work out on paper. So it's just to test your conceptual understanding of a particular topic. And then the students commit to an individual answer. <coughs> so here in this course, I'm going to use a website called Poll Everywhere. Um, so I'll give you that later on. So you can just use your smartphone, um, your laptop or, or whatever. You can even use an old style phone. Even if you haven't got one, you can just take part. Um, so then the instructor would review the responses from the students and see whether they were on the right track or not. And then the students discuss their thinking and answers with their peers. <coughs> so um, if enough students weren't quite on the right track, then I would get you to discuss amongst yourselves what you thought the right answer was. And then the students then commit to an individual answer after this discussion session. And then the instructor would then again review the responses and decide if more explanation is needed. So the theory behind this uh, teaching method um, is that in this, this stage where I get you to discuss your thinking with your peers, the idea is that students who've got the correct answer, who've, got, who've understood the, the concept of the question, will convince those with the incorrect answer through force of logic. So the guy with the right answer will win the argument with the person with the incorrect answer. And it's also thought that concepts are better explained by someone who's just understood them. So if I were to try and explain a particular physical concept to you, um, I've already got an understanding of it that I probably got a long time ago. And the way I'd explain it to you um, might not be the best way for a beginner to understand it. Whereas someone who's just understood it will have an understanding of how to explain it better because they've just understood it. So this is why it's called a peer instruction. So in some sense, um, you'll be teaching each other some of these concepts. So in this course, for practical reasons, some lecturing is still required. Um, so what I want to do in future is have at least some of the lecturing online, which is just why I'm doing just doing this filming so this wouldn't end up online this is just for um, just for a test to see how it goes um, when concepts are introduced there will be questions on it to help construct your knowledge and some of these questions you can answer on your mobile device so that will be the peer instruction aspect there's no marks for answers, this is just for feedback. And exam questions will be based on these questions that we go through throughout the lecture course. Um, and these will all be available online. So you'll be able to find all the lectures and all the questions that we've been through. And there'll be a revision of these questions at the end of the course. So when we get to the end, I'll leave some space at the end so we can then go back and go through all the questions that we've been through throughout the course. So these are the course books. So 
there's the Young and Friedman, which you should have. You might have a different edition to this. Um, there's also electronics, a systems approach. No need to buy this. Um, the appropriate chapters are on Blackboard and all the stuff that we need from that book is in the lecture, the lectures anyway, which you can also download. So this is the course content. As I said, we've got section one, which will be on electricity and circuit theory. Then there's section two, which will be on capacitors and electrical measurement. And then finally, section three, which will be on logic gates, Boolean expressions. So Boolean expressions are the mathematics that we use to describe logic gates. So logic gates are the building blocks of computers. So we'll go through what, what these actually are. Um, and there's Carnot maps, which are ways of designing logic circuits, so simplifying um, logic expressions in order to build the simplest logic device to perform a particular logic operation. And we'll also look at binding numbers. So that is the course content that will have these three sections. Uh, so this is the assessment. So the first piece of assessment you'll have is the January test, well, apart from the homework section. So there'll be a test in January on the semester one content only, and that will be 10% of this course. Uh, then there's the semester one, okay, actually, so in this test, we're going to have 60% from uh, about 10 short questions and then 40% from two longer questions. So that would be the structure of this January test. Then there'll be three pieces of homework, which together will um, give 10% of the grade for this course. Um, they should take around about two hours each, just as a rough guide. Um, There'll be one on electricity and circuits in the first section, which will be done using the Mastering Physics website. So that's the website connected with the Mastering Physics textbook. There'll be one on capacitors, again, from the Mastering Physics website. And then a third one on digital electronics, which will just be a hand in. So. Um, there'll be somewhere on Blackboard where you can submit that. So that's just because there isn't anything suitable in the Mastering Physics website. Um, so these, these are easy marks, really. So it's, it's a no-brainer to do these homeworks. You get whole 10% for all three of them. Um, and then for semester two, which will be a different instructor, um, again, there'll be 10% for the homeworks. Then you'll have laboratory work, the fundamental C, again with different instructors, um, and that'll be 30% of the mark. And then there'll be a May exam, which will um, be both semester one and semester two content, and uh, that will count for 40%. So there'll usually be a choice, a question, so you'll be able to choose between semester one and semester two content, but you won't be able to do just one semester entirely. Okay. So before we get into the actual course content will have a quiz. There is a prize sitting here if you hadn't noticed it and we'll be using this website. So if you go to kahoot.it on your mobile device 
a laptop computer. If you haven't got one, then you can just note the answer down, see if you see what you do. Um, so enter the game pin when I give it to you. And then choose a nickname, so you can choose anything. Um, yeah, nothing rude, please, because they all pop up on the screen. Um, and then when I start the quiz, the questions will appear on the projector, something like this. And then there'll be a few seconds reading time. And then the answers will appear. And then you'll see something like that on your device. And then you just pick the correct colour shape on your device. So I just need to go in and log in. That's really long. So if you go to that Kahoot.it website and then you just put in this game pin, I'm getting longer and longer in this guys. And then you choose a nickname. Is that everyone, anyone else waiting no, to join? Okay, that's fine. Anybody else waiting to join? Yeah. 